<laughs> Greetings, everybody. It's really nice to see so many people out here today. Um, my name is Paul Muncy. I'm an instructor of history and geography here at Northeast, and this is our second hot talk of the season. Um, today, uh, Professor Brandon Keller is going to be doing some work on uh, grocery store mind tricks with us. He's in his sixth year as an agribusiness instructor here at Northeast Community College, where he strives to create an interactive learning environment both in and out of the classroom. He has served as the lead principal investigator on a National Science Foundation grant in precision, uh, precision agriculture, and is currently serving as a co-principal investigator on the Northeast NSF Urban Agricultural Grant that started in July 2022. Is Dr. T the other person? Is. Of course, Dr. T is the other person because Dr. T does everything. Uh, let's see here. Keller is currently working towards his PhD in human services, specialized in leadership studies at the University of Nebraska, uh, where he is combining his diverse leadership experiences in nonprofit organizations and passion for global studies. Keller holds an MBA in Agricultural Economics from Northwest Missouri State University, which he got in 2017, and I believe immediately got a full-time job here. Two weeks, yeah. Wow. That yeah, that doesn't happen in academia. No. Ever. <laughs> I, I went ahead and suffered in adjunct purgatory for like 12 years before this one. But, and, so I'm not jealous or anything. <laughs> And he also has a Bachelor's of Science in Agricultural Economics, specialized in natural resources and environmental sciences from Kansas State University in 2015. Brandon does a lot, and in his free time, you can find him on stage with the Norfolk Community Theater in, in the gym, traveling the globe, he's got two weeks of like conferences and other things coming up here, or breathing underwater as an avid scuba diver, and like I said, he does pretty much everything. So today, he's going to talk about the grocery store, which of course has pretty much everything. So please put your hands together for Brandon Keller. Are we doing okay on volume? Is that... So can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Well, thank you, Paul, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to cross something off a bucket list for me. Uh, now, this may sound like a weird bucket list item from a college instructor, but I've always wanted to do a public lecture at a college that I worked at. Now that seems really weird when you teach in a classroom five days a week, you lecture multiple days, why in the world would you want to give once again another lecture? Uh, but it just seemed like a fun bucket list time, so that's where we are. Uh, we have apparently some nice Halloween effects going with our projector up here, so we'll go with that. I'd like to thank you all for being here. It's an awesome crowd. I know there's a lot of things that you could have chose to do tonight. Um, about 500 yards away, there is a production getting ready to start with Norfolk Community Theater, um, which is really, it's the Greg's of Raft, so it's covering economics and kind of maybe a different side of grocery stores or the lack of groceries. Um, so you chose us over them. You should go support them as well this weekend as you can. And for many of you, I probably stand between you and the start of a fall break, uh, which is about as good as having that lecture right before lunch. Um, so everyone's eager and chopping at the bit. Um, so this evening we're going to talk a little bit about grocery store mind tricks. Um, and why exactly are we talking grocery store mind tricks? Why in the world would psychology be involved with the grocery store? Kind of a thought-provoking topic that we're going to go into it this evening. Um, so a little bit about how I arrived here. I know I see some familiar faces who have been in class with me before in my Ag 13, Agri 1310 course. Uh, so, within agriculture, as an agribusiness instructor, one of the things that we look at is the food chain. Now, the food chain starts at a producer end, which most of the students in my classroom kind of have a unique role in the food chain because they're at the producer end. And it goes all the way through a long value-added process till we make it to the consumer. Um, usually at a grocery store, however, it could be directly from the farmer as well. Most of my students are actually on both ends of that chain, which is a little bit unique when we look at this process because we have to put on both hats. Sometimes we're the producer producing the food, the other times we're at the grocery store buying the food. Um, so really this gives me the chance to really dive in a little bit on what makes a consumer tick. How do we make those choices? And if you think about your most recent grocery store experience, 
you get home, you're unpacking those grocery bags, and you say, how in the world did this package of Oreos make it home? That wasn't on my shopping list. So we're going to talk a little bit about the answer to that question tonight of how exactly did those Oreos make it in that bag, as well as other things that you may not notice are happening as you walk through the grocery store. Um, so a little bit more about me, so Paul did a great job um, introducing me there. Um, so with my education background, so as Paul said, I did do my undergrad at Kansas State University. My interest in grocery stores and food actually started with a class called Introduction to Food Science. Now it was not because of the biology behind it, because frankly that was terrifying. It was about the same time that Listeria was in cantaloupe and we were looking at how pre pretty much food could kill you, was half the class. The other half of the class was how food marketers get you to try and buy their products. Which is kind of interesting to look at, but when you think of this year alone, thousands of new products have actually hit the shelf, and over 90% of those will have already been removed from the shelf by the end of the year. Because consumers just didn't like them, they weren't buying them, they tried them and they said, gross. Um, Lay's actually has a whole marketing campaign behind that that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, then I moved on to Northwest Missouri State University where I did my master's degree and I took a course there called strategic marketing. And that's when I started connecting the dots between food science and marketing. What are they doing to get us to buy things? And then it starts getting really scary and I apologize ahead of time, your trips to the grocery store after this talk are probably going to be ruined forever because you're going to start noticing things. And then this fall, I actually just started my PhD with University of Nebraska-Lincoln studying leadership studies there, uh, which is a neat opportunity. I'll get to talk a little bit here at the end on the global perspective of grocery and kind of what grocery stores look like from a global standpoint as well. Um, so my career journeys kind of inform this interest as well. Uh, what you're going to look at here, and as we go through this, this is not a linear journey by any means. So if we think of all of our dream career paths, and maybe you have, okay, this is what I want to do for a goal career, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. Uh, so that's kind of the theme here. So this all actually started with working with customers as a student fundraiser. Uh, what I did was I cold called alumni three and a half hours a night and asked them for money. <laughs> uh, you learn a lot about customer service, you learn, learn a lot about customers at that point, and you learn a lot of creative vocabulary over the phone. Um, after that I did have the opportunity, I actually taught a semester, I got to teach my peers in an agri-marketing course at K-State in a recitation situation, so I had 53 undergraduate students, the same exact level as me, and I was teaching them. Uh, terrifying and humbling experience at times, but that's when I figured out maybe college education isn't so bad. I moved on to work for the Kansas Department of Agriculture with the rest of my college career there. My job with Kansas Department of Ag, I was in the accounting department and I processed all of the food licensing for the state of Nebraska, or for the state of Kansas. It'd be weird if Kansas was processing Nebraska. <laughs> um, so I know all kinds of weird facts, like there's 137 Casey's gas stations in the state of Kansas as of 2015 because I processed every single one of their licenses. But that also got me thinking about how many places to get food are out there. When you look at Kansas, you have a whole half of a state that there's not much of anything. If you've ever traveled I-70, um, you would know that as well. During my time really throughout college, and still now I actually work for a camp in St. Joseph, Missouri. Um, and during that time, I actually got tapped to be our retail manager one summer for the store that we run. And this is where I learned really the trenches of consumer marketing and how do you get people to buy things. Now the target market looks different at a camp. We're looking at six-year-olds to 18. So you're looking at candy and ice cream. And I had the challenge of taking over a retail operation that was actually losing $20,000 a year. And my job was to go in and figure out what went wrong. Yeah, really fun time. <laughs> Good news is we actually turned that around to a $30,000 profit that year. So if you offer the correct products for a consumer, they come back. That's what we learned there. Um, I did do some substitute teaching before I moved on to Northwest Missouri State. There I actually was a graduate teaching assistant. I worked a lot in marketing and management during that time, particularly in international business. I've been doing some teaching with a professor there. And then in 2017, two weeks after I walked the stage at Northwest, I got a phone call from Kareen Morris at the time and said, we'd love for you to come be our ag business instructor. Um, and I was fortunate enough to start that fall actually with Paul and Sarah Celine, 
and we're all still here today, so that's exciting as well. And um, so that's kind of the weird zigzag journey of how we ended up here and how we're now talking about a grocery store um, right before fall break and right before the season where we really hit the grocery store hard with Thanksgiving and things coming up. So what we're going to talk about this evening, some kind of five main content areas we're going to move through here. The first, I'm going to introduce you to the grocery store. Now that seems weird. Raise your hands. Who's been to a grocery store before? Good. Most of us have been to the grocery store. Um, however, you may not know the grocery store the way I'm going to introduce it to you. One of the reasons I want to do this, I want you to be familiar with some of the terminology we're going to use tonight, because we're going to use things like in caps and mid aisle. Uh, so I want you to know exactly where we're talking about when we go through that talk. We're going to talk about the money that you spend in the grocery store, which seems to be more and more these days. We'll talk about that a little bit as well. Where does it actually go? What's it go towards? Who gets that money? Um, we're going to talk about the tale of two shoppers, which may or may not be inspired by two Northeast faculty members, that that's going to be modeled after, after there. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the mind tricks that the marketers use to get you to buy. And then last, I'll do just a little bit on grocery stores abroad, some of the travels I've had and what I've noticed in grocery stores elsewhere compared to here in the US. So some quick facts about grocery stores for you here this evening. First of all, Norfolk, Nebraska is very unique. We have two high V's to service 23,000 people. Uh, most bigger cities only get one high V. So we're very unique in that. And if you've ever been to the two different high V's, if you haven't had a chance to do this, they service very different markets. Uh, so take the chance, if you're a Northeast student, you're probably more Northeast or the East High V because it's close to campus. Take a chance to go to the West High V, look at the product offerings, and start thinking about what consumer class they're targeting their products towards versus High V East. I think you may be amazed on kind of the income and consumer groups that they're looking at there. So, some quick facts for you. Um, on average, consumers live within three miles of a grocery store. So if we look at the U.S., consumers live within three miles of a grocery store. Let's think about that for a second. How many of you are coming from a rural community or living in the middle of the country? Okay, keep your hand raised if the grocery store is outside of that three-mile radius. Okay, so we may be outliers when we talk about this statistic here in the state of Nebraska. However, we also have to look at you have places like Washington, D.C., New York City, where people have a grocery store directly below their apartment. So this is an average across the whole population. Um, most of the data we're going to work with is going to be pre-pandemic or right in the middle of pandemic, um, just with the way the USDA works with food data here. So in 2019, the U.S. actually had 115,526 stores that had food. So that's grocery stores, gas stations, Dollar Generals, all of those are linked in there. So that's across the whole U.S. That's a lot of places to go and get food. And then of those, the top four grocery chains that come across there, anyone surprised by number one? It's Walmart. Uh, number two would be Kroger, probably not a brand that we're familiar with here in Northeast Nebraska. Um, if you've been to Omaha, they do have a Kroger that would be Dillon's yeah. uh, that they have there. Um, Russ's, Russ Market also falls under that. If you go in south, it's just called Kroger. Um, Albertsons, which is going to be uh, more of your coastal, and then Target is actually number four. Um, so kind of interesting there. Walmart's an interesting one to be at the top of this list because Walmart has its whole fascinating world of looking at consumers. Uh, so if you've ever walked into a Walmart in a community that's not your own, one of the things that you need to know about Walmart it will tell you about the population makeup of the community that you're in. So if we walk into Walmart here in Norfolk, what do we notice about the food section? Is there any maybe ethnic groups that are more served in that food section? Yes? Which ones? We have a lot more of a Hispanic population in terms of our food service there. Um, so if you look, there's a lot more Hispanic in, um, cooking based ingredients that you're going to find within those aisles. If we look at Madison County, where we are right now, there's actually a proportionally larger Hispanic population. So to serve that, Walmart makes sure that they have products to support that culture. 
if I walk into Walmart in Northwest Arkansas, I don't really have those Hispanic products. I have more Americanized products or things that you'd see in the South. We start seeing things like grits show up on the shelf where you may be lucky to find a few packages here. So it's really interesting. You can walk, walk into Walmart and have a cultural indicator of what is the makeup of this community. So always a fun way you can kind of keep that in mind there. Um, COVID had a huge impact on how we shop as well. Um, and we all know the news headlines and things, and this could be a whole nother lecture in terms of food shortages, milk shortages, produce shortages, and what caused that, but we're not gonna go down that road today. Um, however, the way we shop changed. Um, we all learned about online shopping, which is still my personal favorite in the world. I never have to step foot in a Walmart again. <laughs> I pull up the app, I add the things to my cart, I pull up my designated time, they load it in my car, I go home. I don't have to walk into Walmart, it's the best thing in the world. And a lot of us continue to adopt that habit afterwards because it's a lot easier to say, okay, order online, go pick up. I don't have to spend the time at the grocery store. Um, and then we know that chains are gonna change by region. So we said Kroger's not a common one here. hy is gonna be our common big distributor within our area. We go more south, you're gonna see Kroger. Um, if you go more southeast, you're gonna see a chain called Publix uh, pop up quite a bit. Uh, particularly in the Florida area there. So each area kind of has their own grocery chain that serves them as well. So it's really interesting when we start looking at that as well. Um, if we look at this in terms of breakout of what kind of food stores we have, so there's 115 and a half thousand places to get food, 92% um, of those are actually grocery stores. It's a lot of grocery stores around the US. Then again, when you start looking at our community, 23,000 people, we have four, or actually five main grocery stores. We have Target there too. So two high bees a local grocery store being Lou's, Walmart, Target. We have five. Um, so we're kind of hogging that market. However, we're serving those rural communities around us as well. Um, only 4.6 of those are actually convenience stores. Convenience stores here are classified as those with fuel pumps, so places that you can get gas as well. This is your Casey's General Store. Now, convenience stores are a big thing in the U.S. population because we like convenience. Uh, we like the ability that I can stop and get gas, pick up dinner, um, get an evening refreshment, pick up uh, aspirin for my headache, and get my cigarettes and head home. One-stop shop, done. And if I have kids, that's even better. It's one trip out of the car. Perfect. And then 3.3% of these are specialty food stores. This is going to be like Natural Works downtown that focuses in that natural food arena. So let's do a quick tour of the grocery store here. So I have a YouTube video. I'm hoping this is going to work. We don't need the audio for it. And I'm going to speed this up a little bit because it goes painfully slow otherwise. Um, so we're going to go double speed. And let's kind of look at our walk through the grocery store here. Really fast music now. So when we walk into the grocery store, we always enter in the produce area. Why do you think that is? Anyone, any thoughts? Because that's not where we make our impulse buys. It's not where we make our impulse buys necessarily. But, but if I put a bunch of bananas in my cart to start off my shopping trip, I no longer feel guilty when I put that package of Oreos in my <laughs> cart later on. I make a healthy choice. <laughs> I feel good about myself, and then I move through the store. So as we're noticing around the outside is all of the convenience products that we have. Our deli, our to-go foods. We get towards the back, we get into our meat departments. Our proteins, um, frozen food, and this one's going to be featured in the middle as well as some coolers on the side. We're going to talk about the frozen food section here in a little bit. Middle aisles, packed with products. Lots of different choices, lots of different brands usually organized in a logical fashion. Notice I say usually there are some stores that may be not as logical. And food marketers perfect, uh, purposely actually rearrange these aisles about every two years. And then we walk into the grocery store, we hear our grandparent, oh, they rearranged Walmart again. Because that way you have to walk up and down all of those aisles and you walk past a product that you may pick up. See, you're never gonna think of the grocery store the same way again. So we're walking through, see, now we're starting to notice the milk section, the dairy section. So the eggs, milk, breads, 
These are the back corner of the store furthest away from the entrance. Because now for those essential things that pretty much every family's buying, they've now had to walk the whole store through the maze and they're more likely to put a product in their cart. And we really hope that they show up hungry because now the smell of that deli or fresh break bed spreads in the air and we start making more and more impulse buys and putting this in our cart. Of course, then we have those convenience things like the pharmacy that come in here as well and other convenience products. Not all grocery stores are going to have this. Uh, liquor stores is going to be the other common one. A floral department, a high bee particularly here has all of those. And then we get up front, we have all those fun feature items that are on sale that are usually the exact same price if they'd be on the shelf in the main store. But it's at the checkout, we're waiting in line and we say, oh gosh, you know, m and sound pretty good. And they end up in our cart as well. So that's our quick tour of the grocery store. See a lot better on two times speed there. So with that, we noticed at the end of the aisles, we have a thing called an end cap. That's going to be an important piece of knowledge here in a little bit. And we kind of noticed that the aisles may be arranged in a certain method that we're going to talk about here in a little bit as well. So now that we've taken the tour of the grocery store, we've put everything in our shopping cart, it's now time to go to the cash register. It'd be that a person checking us out or us checking ourselves out. And again, that could be a whole other debate that we're not going to have tonight be a fun class debate. Maybe we'll work that into class sometime. Uh, it's time to spend the money. And if you're like me, I ring out and then I get my receipt and I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I spend that much money that quick? So we start asking ourselves an important question of where in the world did that money go? No video is not going to end. Perfect. There we go. So an activity for you. You all have a whiteboard at your table. I am going to give you different categories that the money that you spend in the grocery store go to. Your job is to estimate if I spend one dollar in the grocery store, so just a dollar bill, which would be an impressive feat in today's economy. I want you to estimate how much of that dollar bill goes into each of these categories. So this is kind of a quiz, this is like a pretest. We're going to answer this question here in a little bit, but I want to see where we are here. So our categories are farm production. So this is going to be the money spent on things like inputs to actually produce the products that are going to the grocery store. Processing. So most individuals today, if they walked into the grocery store and we had just live chicken sitting on the shelf, would probably freak out. They aren't going to know what to do with them. So it has to be processed now. We've kind of lost that art over time. Then we have to package it. So packaging is going to be involved here. And food's not just right next door to the grocery store, particularly in an urban area, so we need to transport it to get there. And then, of course, there's the middlemen, so wholesale trade, retail trade, those that are actually selling to the grocery store and the grocery store. Food services is going to refer to those services like the deli in the grocery store. Or if you're like me, every once in a while it's more convenient to buy the pre-cut pineapple rather than cut my own. Energy, finance and insurance, which is an area we don't think about with our food, but every single retailer, every single processor is insuring themselves just in case something goes wrong along the way. Advertising, which is what we're really talking about tonight. And then there's going to be other here. This is going to talk about other business services such as legal, so the legal counsel these companies keep on. So you have one dollar. How much of that dollar is going into each of these categories? I'll give you a chance to discuss at your table. Okay. So let's go ahead and put those markers down. Keep those answers on the board. We're going to check our quiz answers here in just a few minutes. I'm going to let you self-grade tonight. So none of the instructors need more papers to grade at this point. It's midterm grading. We're going to let you grade your own assignment here tonight. You're you can laugh, it's fine. I have plenty of dad jokes, my students are groany, yeah, at least we it's fine. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to introduce to you a concept called the USDA food dollar. So each year the US Department of Agriculture does research in terms of consumer spending. The way this works is they use what's called a market basket approach. Each of us are, each of us are uniquely different consumers in terms of the products that we're going to buy, how much of a product we're going to buy, 
maybe you know I'm a single family household versus someone who has seven kids, how much we need of milk is going to change versus based on how many is in the household. So we use what we call a market basket. What this looks at is basically a normal grouping of products that the average American consumer buys. And they summarize all this together and then they look at the money spent on that. Where did it actually go? So we're going to look at this from two different perspectives. The first is what we call the marketing bill. This is straight up the money that you spend in the grocery store is split into two categories. It goes into two pots. Pot number one is the farm share. So of that dollar bill that you gave to the cashier, 16 cents of that dollar went back to that farm producer. 16%. The other 84% went somewhere else in that market, retail, trade, food services, wholesale, transportation. A little bit of an alarming thing to look at, particularly as an ag business instructor, looking at particularly when we have the number of farms going down, the number of producers going down and a world population going up, that we have a, such a small chunk that makes it back to support those individuals. So now let's break this down a little bit further. So we have the farm share at 16 cents. We have the marketing share, 84 cents. So this is the industry grouping. So if we look at that marketing, that 84 cents that went to marketing, and we say, okay, we extrapolate that back out to a dollar, this is actually where all of this money ends up in terms of profits. Eight cents of that, or 8%, is the farm producer's profit for the year. So of all of the hard work that they're going to put in, they're going to make eight cents on every dollar that's spent on an ag product in the grocery store. Food processing, again, those pre-made deli mealtime to go situations, 16.7 cents or 16.7% goes to that part of the industry. Packaging actually only makes up 3.1%. Surprisingly enough, particularly here in the US where we use quite a bit of packaging, I'm surprised it's not higher, although we are doing that in bulk. Transportation, now this is in 2020. Mm -hmm. So it means this ended December 31st, 2020 in terms of the data. If we were to have done this talk like two months later, we would have had the 2021 data. Uh, so USDA just announced today, they're releasing that on November 17th. Uh, transportation was 4.1 cents. So that covers the rail, the fuel, however they got the products where they needed to go. Wholesale trade. These are the big wholesalers that are selling into the retail market. We actually have one here in town, so uh, 13th Street and 275, you have affiliated out there, or is it still affiliated? Yeah, associate. Associate, thank you. Uh, so they're out there, they're a wholesaler for um, what's called the Thriftway brands here in the area. It's one of the big markets they serve. Um, hy V actually does all of their wholesale trade themselves. That way they get a bigger chunk of this marketing bill. Retail trade makes up 14.2%. What that means is that's paying for their utilities, keep the lights on to employ their employees, to keep them there, 14.2 cents. Food services make up 27.9. So that's the big chunk there. Um, and I think I misspoke earlier. Food processing would be the processing side. Food services is that ready-made um, stuff there. Energy is actually only 3.6%. We do expect this is gonna go up in the next food bill. Um, with energy prices, particularly natural gas oil, going a little bit up in that 2021 time frame. Finance and investment, 3.3. This is going to be mainly loan interest that these businesses are paying back on operating loans. Advertising, surprisingly, is only at 2.9 cents. Which, when you look at a Super Bowl ad costing $7 million for 30 seconds, 2.9 cents is doing pretty good. And then that other is going to count for 4.3. That's going to be your legal fees in any catch-all situation there. How do we do on the quiz? Failed. Good. That fail. Uh-oh. Like average, so we just don't quite. Okay. Were we surprised by any of these categories? Advertising. Advertising. I thought that was going to be like 20%. Okay. I thought advertising was going to be huge. And packaging as well. Students, any surprises? Farm production. Farm production, okay. That it's so low. Yeah, it's so low. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, the important thing to do is remember this is an average. So products like eggs, obviously they don't have a lot of processing. There's going to be a larger share that makes it back to the producer then. You'd said before that in the whole deal, 
the farm portion was 16%, I think? Correct. And so this 8%, is that just what their profit is for the yes, farmer? Yes, this is just profit. So they get that 16. They get the 16, but eight of that's already gone in inputs. So half of what they're getting is gone. And can I ask with the food services, uh, is that all just going directly then to the, uh, uh, the grocery store itself? Like it the, depends. Um, so food services can be classified in a lot of different areas as kind of conglomerate. So that would also be like your locally owned butcher shops. Um, those kind of individuals would fall in there as well. Okay. Great questions. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about the money we send in the store, let's talk about the tale of two shoppers. So story time. Um, I'm really sad Lisa Gunther's not here to enjoy the story with us. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to introduce two shoppers for you um, that shop here locally in Norfolk. Um, shopper A and Shopper B. So we've removed their names for identifying information purposes here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about their childhood, how they grew up, and then a little bit about their adulthood, how they live now. So Shopper A. Shopper A's childhood, they actually grew up within one mile of a grocery store throughout their life. They were within one mile of a grocery store at all times. Small community, 3,500 people, one mile within a grocery store. Fast forward to adulthood, full-time employed, Northeast Community College. They now live within two miles of a grocery store. They live in a little bit bigger community now. So a little bit further away. They have a salaried career. So they have a steady income coming in. And they have reliable transportation. So they're not dependent on a public transportation. They aren't walking reliable transportation to get to and from a store. Shopper B, their childhood looks a little bit different. They grew up over 45 minutes from a grocery store. So it was a little bit more of a production when you got to go to town. They grew up in the country, they grew up on a ranch. Their adult life, they also now live within two miles of a grocery store. They have a salary career and they have reliable transportation. So looking at the adult lives of these two shoppers, do we think their shopping habits look the same or different? If we're just looking at their adult life? If we're just looking at their adult life. Same. Okay, Same. but if we factor in childhood, yeah. does it still look the same? I would expect Shopper B to be in the habit of loading up as many groceries as possible and Shopper A being in the habit of going once every other day. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Students, any thoughts? Yeah? Same? So let's look at what happens when Shopper A and Shopper B go shopping. Shopper A. Grocery shopping habits, weekly. At least once a week they're at the grocery store. Be that high vee Walmart, Target, Lou's, somewhere at least once a week. If they look at their at-home food storage, so what's in the freezer, what's in the pantry, in terms of being able to put together full meals three times a day, they have two weeks of food storage at home. Uh, now this probably has changed a little bit over COVID times as we looked at quarantine requirements, things like that, having a little bit more backup. Their average trip to the grocery store, they're going to spend $65 on a grocery bill. Shopper B. Their grocery shopping experience is every two to three months. And that is actually being generous at some times. Their at-home food storage potential that I estimate would be roughly six months of what I would consider a well-rounded nutritional three times a day. Their average grocery bill when they go to the grocery store is obviously a little bit higher. You're looking 250 to 350 within that. So if we look at the shopping habits between Shopper A and Shopper B, what happened? Shopper A has never really lived in a situation where they have to stockpile or they have to have a whole bunch because the grocery store is readily accessible. Shopper B, obviously, they grew up in that childhood of it was 45 minutes from the grocery store. Some of our students are smiling. This is probably almost a reality for them as well. Those habits carry over into adult life. So here's the other bad news I have for everyone today, and again, I apologize in advance. You become the person that raised you. Yeah, 
<laughs> so if that was your parents, grandparents, whoever it is, you were going to become them. Um, so if it's your parents, I'm sorry, you're going to become your parents eventually. <laughs> Terrifying to think of, right? You're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Start looking at your grocery shopping habits already. <laughs> if your mom bought Prego pasta sauce, what pasta sauce are you already buying? Prego, because I'm it's not your marketing association. So our childhood, in terms of marketing decisions, actually inform what we do as adults as well. So let's start talking a little bit about those mind tricks that I promised you at the beginning of the night. Now, I'm not a magician. We're not going to do any magic up here tonight by any means. But the marketers are doing some magic. So we're going to talk about some things. The first thing I want to talk about, how many of you have this wonderful black card in your wallet? called the high deep fuel saver card. It's a wonderful thing, right? I go to the store, I spend money, they give me money back, and I save on fuel. And when fuel's like almost $5 a gallon at points, that's wonderful. Because then I like compound and calculate of, okay, so the Huskers actually did okay this weekend on a score, so I want to compound and get those fuel saver points too. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but we take advantage of it when it does. This is actually a mind trick for consumers though. So we're rewarding behavior to allow the marketer to track you. Now this is not tracking you in terms of what your address is, your activity on Facebook, that they have those abilities as well. Uh, but this is tracking what you're buying. And this gets really interesting when you start looking at things like coupons that you get from the grocery store. In fact, there's whole giant equations in the marketing world now that if a family household that's just male and female, husband and wife, that starts buying more milk all of a sudden. They start getting coupons for diapers, baby formula, and baby food. Because what we've seen through market research is when they start buying more milk at home, means they're likely preparing to have a child. There's some indicator within that marketing mix that says, likely this consumer is preparing to have a baby. So they start sending them baby product advertisements. So they start learning your purchasing behaviors and tailoring that towards you. And now it almost gets a little bit creepy at points when we start looking at some of these smart marketing things. Because let's say I go on Amazon tonight and I look up a food product. And then I come to work tomorrow and my Google account's linked to the Google Chrome page I was on. And now I'm seeing this food product show up on every single advertisement on the articles I'm looking at. So the smartness of this marketing is kind of getting scary, almost stalkerish at times. Uh, or when Netflix sends you an email saying, we haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> also a little bit creepy, particularly around Halloween. Let's think about the actual grocery store. When you walk into the grocery store, does it feel fairly welcome? So we look at the lighting, bright lights. I have not been in a lot of grocery stores that are dark that I'm really concerned for my safety by any means. Bright lights overhead. Music's always happy. There's usually not a lot of country music that plays in a grocery store because there's usually not a lot of happy topics that come with that. So usually it's pop music, it's upbeat, it's light, it's instrumental. But it's all positive upbeat there. And it's clean. So a nice, clean, welcoming environment, usually temperature is tolerable. I'd be here recently, it's been a little cold. So a nice, welcoming environment. Why do you think they do this? They want you to stay longer? They want you to stay longer. So if I'm comfortable in an environment, I'm gonna stay. It'd be like going home, putting on sweatpants, which I mean, I could wear to Walmart as well, or high vee or anywhere else. I'm comfortable in the environment, I'm gonna stay longer, I'm welcome. They have planned product placement. Again, we talked about walking into that grocery store, you walk right into the produce. I make a healthy selection, now it's okay to make an unhealthy selection. I'm a certified personal trainer, I do the exact same thing, the Oreos make it in the car to go home with me. Oreos are sacred, we keep those around. <laughs> so we strategically place products. The other thing, if we look at different products that we have. So I went shopping earlier tonight. And I went down the cereal aisle. And we have Captain Crunch, and we have multi-grain Cheerios. I had to reach down to get this off one of the bottom shelves. Why do you think...
Captain Crunch was down on a bottom shelf. Kids. The kids could see it. And if you've ever had an experience shopping with a four-year-old, this ends up in the cart, or they throw a fit until it ends up in the cart. This was on one of the top shelves. Why? It's where the adults are looking at. Now if we look at the packaging between these two boxes. Kid-friendly, lots of colors, the back has games, uh, it avoids pretty much any mention of nutrition we possibly can. Uh, it's inviting for the kid. I want to play the games. I want Captain Crunch. That's what I want. It looks delicious. For an adult, I'm a little bit more concerned about my health. So this is telling me, okay, so I have 28 grams of whole grain. Perfect. I need that in my diet. So we start looking at things there. Uh, on the back, it's telling us about a healthy lifestyle, the special minerals that we have in it that are going to help improve us. So they're tailoring towards the different consumers there within packaging as well. I saw the same thing in the mac and cheese aisle. Frozen versus regular craft mac and cheese. So if I'm a four-year-old, I want frozen mac and cheese. Or if I'm a 30-year-old, I want frozen mac and cheese. <laughs> if they had Hocus Pocus mac and cheese, that's what I'd be buying. <laughs> or if we look at fruit snacks, if I'm a four-year-old, I want the Avengers, not just the regular Mott's brand. So we play into the kid-friendly packaging as well. We put it at their eye level. We want them to make those selections. Kid-friendly, eye level. The grocery store is designed for you to walk the full thing. Uh, most articles that you read about a grocery store are actually going to refer to it as you as a mouse in a maze. And then really when you start looking at it, Everything on your grocery list, when you look at a normal market mix, is spread out across the store. So now I need, okay, so if I'm making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it takes like three different aisles to get everything that I need. That's by design. We want you to walk through that whole store. If I just need a gallon of milk, I have to walk all the way to the back and then come up front. I, I got a question. Absolutely. Okay, during COVID, when they put the lines and deliberately had you go down a certain way, did that change into their marketing? Because I was one of those people that's like, I'm not following your stupid arrows. But most <laughs> it was like people 95 did. Most people. people did, though. Did that change any of the thinking? Data is still preliminary on that. Um, they really haven't gotten deep into that. What I noticed, particularly in the Midwest states, so kind of where we are, the Great Plains area, most consumers didn't pay attention to the arrows on the ground anyways. Uh, but it also became the issue of products actually on the shelves. It was more of, I'm going to buy what's available. So brand loyalty kind of went out the door for about two years, which is kind of an interesting change in consumer trend. We make feel-good choices. Again, if I choose a healthy product, I'm okay with getting an unhealthy product. It's okay, because I made a healthy choice. We're good. Displays and end caps draw you in. So we think of the end of that aisle. Store brands hardly ever there unless it's a fuel saver sale at high beat. Most of the time they're going to be a little bit more expensive products. They're going to be name brand because that company's paying good money for that product to be front and center. They actually pay for prime or um, yeah that word. They pay for prestigious placement within the store. They use big displays to draw you in as well. My favorite time of year is going to Walmart during the Super Bowl. Pepsi always does a big display to draw people in to advertise the Super Bowl. They're paying thousands of dollars to have this front space in front of Walmart just to showcase their products. Because if it's at the forefront of the consumer's mind that, wow, Pepsi supports the Super Bowl, I remember that really cool display. Even six months down the road, I see a bottle of Pepsi on the shelf, I'm like, Oh yeah, they had that really cool display in the front of Walmart. So we start associating with that. Then we talk about that bright lights, happy music, keeps us going there. So lots of different mind tricks being played on us when we go to the store. So I've got a quick video from Business Insider that kind of walks through some other things that we may not notice are going on when we go to the store. Let's see if we can get audio to go to. Thirty-two million Americans hit the grocery store every day. That's one out of every seven people. The average person.
person goes more than one and a half times a week. So chances are you look at it as pretty routine. And with that very mindset, supermarkets have you right where they want you. We did the research and found that these places are set up to tap into your instincts and get you to buy exactly what they want you to buy. And it begins with that first whiff. The first thing you're likely to see and smell in a grocery store are the bakery and flower sections. Smell has a huge impact on your intent to buy. It works quicker than the other senses. Smells immediately connect with that part of your brain that triggers emotions. It's all part of what stores call olfactory marketing. Having this stuff in the front makes you happy and gets you in the mood to gleefully spend some cash. The aisles of stores are organized in that racetrack up and down format on purpose. Studies show that we're hardwired to go up and down each aisle in succession like rats in a maze, following the path the store wants us to, without even thinking about it. Where items are placed on these aisles is also no coincidence. Stores call them planograms. The most popular of these planograms, eye level, is buy level. For example, when you're cruising down the cereal aisle, bulk cereal is down at the bottom, healthy stuff on top, and the pricey brand name cereal is right there at eye level where it's easy to see, examine, and toss in your cart. And supermarkets make bank here. Cereal has an average markup of 44%. Wow. The eye level rule goes for kids too. Their eye level is jam-packed with sugary cereal, Easy Mac, and other kids' stuff. Milk, eggs, and other essentials are tucked away in the back of the store. That makes you go through the entire place to get to them. And once you do get there, it's not cheap. Milk is marked up 55% and eggs 67%. And if you were hoping to visit the supermarket just to get the essentials, don't hold your breath. These staples, eggs, bread, milk, they're spread out in the store's remote corners. It's just another way grocery stores get you to spend lots of time within their walls and see as much expensive stuff as possible you might want to buy. So the next time you embark on your routine weekly shopping trip, go against your instincts. Go in with a list and plan and stick to it. Comb every shelf and aisle to find what you want. Know your store and where to find what you need. And avoid tempting add-on items at checkout like candy, chapstick, and batteries. Maybe this time, you can fool them. So one thing that I'm sad they leave out here about that checkout lane, and we don't see it as much now that we're doing self-checkouts more, but one of the customer service trainings that we give cashiers is to always ask the customer the question, did you find everything you needed? Which usually triggers the response in our brain of, crap, did I find everything I needed? So it triggers that response of, oh, I need to throw something else on real quick. So I grab that bag of M&Ms, I grab that pack of gum, those things that are really convenient that I can throw on quickly. Or we have the magazines right there that draw on our attention with those flashy headlines as well. So all things to trick us into getting that one last sale when we go in. The other one that I'd love that it talks about is the fact of the olfactory marketing. Um, and hy is really good with that. They always have the floral right inside as well. But hy will be baking bread at 9 o'clock at night. So if you ever go hy at 9, uh, that's usually when I shop. There's less people there. Uh, 9 o'clock at night, we're baking bread. Now, that's not a prime time. There's not a lot of consumers there. However, the consumers that are there, we're thinking midnight snack. And then we smell that bread, and we start looking at that point. Ooh, okay. There we go. Fresh brewed coffee first thing in the morning does that for a lot of coffee shops as well. So a little bit of an activity here. At your tables with a group, I want you to do a little bit of a reflection of your last time at the grocery store. What tricks and what traps did you fall for? Was it something that was included? Is it something that wasn't? Take a minute or two, have that discussion, be prepared to share. I always fall for the sugar. I don't. I don't know like how much it's planned out. But I actually found the little tiny. Maybe you use a list. Did you stick to that list? The, the stuff that they produce, like macaroni salad and things. I was like, because I purposely was looking for that because I'm like, how's it different here compared to the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I deliberately was looking for it and found it. And it's like, and then I went back there the last time. And on the end, they have different types of Chinese food. Oh, and we got good like, Chinese food at high And I was like, well, let me, because that's something my wife would want to know. Uh -huh. yeah. you're, you're still scouting. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, let me 
try it. And so that and also got XL But that was all intentional. Right? That was intentional, but the placement is wonderful because now I know where it is because it's right inside the door. Yeah. And of course hitting your uh, the smells, yeah. making you hungry. But see that's the thing, is I deliberately go to the store. So what do we observe? When I'm not hungry. Because I tried to do that. What was our most recent trip to the grocery store? store? What trip he did a we're laughing over here. He did one of these projects on so I went to the grocery store because I wanted one box of Cosmic Brownies. That's all I wanted. <laughs> and then I walked out with, uh, not the Cosmic Brownies because I couldn't find them. I walked out with the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup Chips Ahoy Cookies, a box of Cheez-Its, and face wash. Ooh. <laughs> I have made lots of trips to the grocery store where I had intention there was one thing I was going to get. And I always end up, like, huh. spending more. How did that happen? It all looks so good. Yeah. So we look at packaging, it's not unappealing. It's designed to look good. It's designed to play to our senses. It's designed to look tasty. What other tricks did we fall for? Even the best list, you know, it's a great tip. It never works. Well, there's definitely been plenty of times where the thing I needed was eggs or milk. And again, I always end up buying more. For me, it's the frozen foods aisle. Because it's always like that's that's right there in Hy-Vee on your way back there, and you know, there's ice cream, there's some awesome like TV dinners. The frozen food pilot uh, aisle is a big trap now too. So we look at grocery stores in 1990 versus today. The amount of freezers and frozen foods that are available, it's like tripled. So you know, you used to have like a aisle of freezers, maybe one half of the aisle of freezers. Now you have two or three aisles, or Walmart sometimes four or five, dedicated to freezer space for food. And a lot of that comes to convenience, it comes to time. So the American consumer is running on a lot busier schedule than we ever have before. So the thing that we turn to, what can I quickly take home, throw in the microwave and have ready? Or what can I throw in the oven, work on another project and then be able to serve? So a lot of that's come from that, and that process side, that's why processing, food processing is increasing within that food dollar as well. So some things to be aware of when we go to the grocery store, and again, I apologize, I just wrecked all of your grocery store trips moving forward. I do want to talk a little bit about grocery stores abroad. Um, so I am blessed with the opportunity to have some international travels. Um, actually, I just got back last May with a group of students from the United Kingdom. And all of these pictures that I have here today are actually from our UK trip. Um, if you're ever a student that gets to travel with me, one of the requirements we have on a trip, it's not part of the itinerary, you have to go to a grocery store with me. Because no matter where I go, I want to visit the grocery store because it tells you a lot about the culture, but it's also fascinating to see how others approach it. Now the UK is a little bit unique. These are not all grocery store photos. Um, so a couple I'll point out here. Uh, bottom, if I can find my mouse, there it is. This photo here is actually steak packaging. So one of the things you're going to notice, packaging, particularly in our European countries, is considerably less in terms of the amount of packaging. Most of it's going to be recyclable based. That way it can be reused within the markets. The other thing they're doing with their beef products, their chicken products, their pork products, and their lamb products is they're actually vacuum sealing. At that point, that way it gives that nice clean look to that steak or that pork chop that you're buying. But they never vacuum seal the ground beef because it looks unappealing when you do that. So they actually air pack it instead. Um, and then the bakery selection up here is a little bit different. This kind of freaked all of us out when we walked in the grocery store. So all of the fresh baked goods go in the different wicker baskets and you just use the tongs and grab whatever you want. This was foreign to us coming out of COVID times that you could just walk in and it's an open basket that anyone can walk up and sneeze on. Uh, so a little bit weird with that. However, in Europe particularly, they use a lot of open market. And one of the farmer markets we got to go to, they actually had their traditional fresh cut meat there on the ice, first thing in the morning, ice packed out. Seafood selections from all around all the coast of the country. And then their fresh farmer's market every single day. What was amazing about the farmer's market is a half bushel of apples was a dollar. And you look at a half bushel of apples here in the price. It was amazing. So we're actually talking to the vendors and we're like, it's amazing how cheap your produce is. And they're like, it's expensive. 
We're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and then we got into Stockholm. Most of it's just, you know, taking a hop, skip, and jump from another European country with them all so close there. Other observations I've noticed. So really the focus on fresh. So here in the US, we're really focused on process and convenience. And other countries are really focused on that fresh. Dinner time, specifically in most cultures, is a very important time for the family to come sit around the table and have a meal. Uh, with someone taking the time to actually prepare that for fresh ingredients. What's amazing is grocery stores really don't change that much in terms of marketing techniques from Brazil to the UK to Italy. You're still going to have your processed goods, you're still going to have your fresh goods, you're going to still have more targeted marketing. But the focus changes to fresh marketing, so fresh foods versus the process. It focuses more on consumer choice. We see that with the bakery up there. I get to pick which of the pastries I want. It's not whatever's packaged in the package together. I want these three. I get to make that choice. I get to go to the farmer's market and pick out the chicken breast that I want. We get that opportunity with our meat counters here at the full service um, butcher counters as well. Minimal sustainable packaging. So we saw that with the meat. Less processed, less pre-made. All of the marketing principles are still there. We're still using those flashy colors. You're still gonna see the kid-friendly products at kid eye level. That part doesn't change. A four-year-old in Brazil is the same as a four-year-old in the US. They want the sugar, they want the sweet products. That part doesn't change. We all act the same when it comes to that stuff. One thing I would like to recommend is reading. Um, so again, from a Lisa Gunther standpoint, you always recommend a book with a presentation. Um, a book called Food Politics kind of goes through and talks about from a global perspective what goes on within that food marketing chain. Uh, so everything from GMO controversies to tricks that we use in the, soup, in the grocery store, or my personal favorite is the politics of obesity. is talked about in here, the US versus other countries around the world. So recommended reading, the Northeast Bookstore does carry this in the spring. If you take my course, we actually use this in the course as well. Um, I would like to thank you all for your time this evening. My contact information is up here. If this was something you're like, wow, I want to learn more about this. I do teach a course in the spring called Ag Marketing Systems, to where we do track that consumer product all the way from the farm gate all the way to the consumer dinner plate. Um, so shameless plug to join in on that class as well. Now yes. before you're done, yes. we are going to open up the floor to questions. Absolutely. I got students in here. No questions? I don't want to ask a question. I have a question. OK. Uh, so, but it's, it's a two-parter. One, a lot of this seems so common sense. Of course you're going to put the sweets where the kids are at and the other things the eye level for the adults. So the first part of the question is, how much do they invest in people that study this for what seems like common sense stuff? And, and the second part to it is, how much is this something's working and they figure out why it's working as opposed to manufacturing like did we always have the produce at the front and then somebody's like hey this actually works out well or did somebody very uh, uh, playing the part of like you know the the, the evil genius I, how, how much are we being directly manipulated and how much of this is just yeah it just makes sense to do it this way absolutely so the first part of the question in terms of how much we're investing mm -hmm. I don't have a dollar amount by any means um, however the world of food product and consumer marketing is vast, and it's a multi-trillion dollar industry with that. Uh, most universities that are going to have a food science program, UNL is one of those, um, Kansas State's one of the nation-renowned ones, they actually have research project after research project that's just bringing in consumers of, okay, here's this food product. How can we appeal for it? What should the packaging look like? What's going to cause you to buy that in the grocery store? And they're looking at the different consumer groups. So there's a lot of paid market research. Uh, a fun thing for college students particularly, they're always looking for those and it's paid, so you make money. And sometimes you get free products out of the deal. Um, so it's a good way to make a little bit of cash on the side and try new things. Um, one of the things I definitely did in college as well. Uh, in terms of how it's set up in the grocery store, I don't know. I'd have to dig into the history a little bit there. So it, if they're putting that much money into it, it does sound like there's a little bit of... There's a method to the madness, yes. There's, there's a, there is a... Because to me that sounds dark. 
It does. That we are that there is a lot of money figuring out how to manipulate us, and we all feel like we're making our own decisions, even with the things that like we know that we buy things that we. But but I'm just you know again it's kind of like that whole thing with Facebook knows everything that's happening, and does that really mean that I know what I'm doing, or am I being manipulated all the way through every single level? And this to me is making me wonder: Do I buy anything on purpose? <laughs> Because I want it, or was I just convinced that I wanted all these things? And do you have a stance on that? Do you land somewhere there? I think we're a little bit both. There's definitely, consumer, we do have the ability to make cognitive choice ourselves, uh, for sure. So like if I go to the grocery store, I know I need eggs because I have a recipe that calls for eggs that I want to make. Uh, however, the other things that end up in the cart, like the piece of cake from the bakery that I wasn't planning on buying, but it looked really good when I walked past it, that's definitely planned in the trip because that was conveniently stationed right next to the checkout zone. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. If you're looking for a European style grocery store here in the Midwest, the, the Aldi stores, yes. ALDI, yes. they're starting to become very popular and we're starting to see them showing up in more places than a lot of several. They are very And all these really unique in the U.S. consumer market because initially when it was introduced, it was perceived as kind of that low-income bulk goods store, and it's really changed in terms of how they market it. Now it's that unique place. Where can I go and try different products? And what store is this? All these. All these. All these. Yeah. I go there every time I go to Omaha because they were just right around the corner from me. They usually have things like cheese advent calendars right around Thanksgiving that sell out like yeah. two hours. It's just weird things, yeah. There are some weird things. So <laughs> one, my, one of the things I've discovered traveling around is it seems like every other country that I've been in, grocery stores are not supermarkets. They're not these massive things. Uh, the aisles are narrower. The, the carts are narrower. Why aren't they trying to push their consumers to buy more stuff as we have been taught to buy? It probably depends on the country and their advancement in terms of what they have. Uh, obviously, we have the capability for a lot of storage within our homes, between refrigeration, freezing, pantry areas. When you look at the size of what they have to live in, usually it's considerably smaller. They don't have the storage capacity that we would, would be one of the pushes. A lot of it's culture too. So going to the grocery store on a Sunday, that's an exciting thing. It's part of our routine. And we see the neighbors there and it becomes a social construct as well. If, if you saw, I think it was Emerson, Nebraska, their grocery store closed and the community came together to form like a coalition. A oh yeah, yeah, I'd heard about that. And it was, it was major news in the state of Nebraska. Absolutely. Because, and the one thing they commented was not so much Grocery, you know, you get stuff, but that social aspect of being, seeing people that know, you know, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that was a grocery co-op that they formed. And usually when we hear the word co-op or cooperative, we think grain marketing. Uh, but really, there's so many different areas of co-ops. That's a whole other talk that we we'll go on. Any other questions? Fantastic. Uh, and yeah, please, one more round of applause, because that was really, you really did kind of, I, I've always loved just walking around grocery stores and just like, especially in the evening when nobody's there, I'm probably not going to enjoy that anymore. But, for anybody that's interested, we still have several Hawk Talks left this uh, semester. I'm going to be delivering a lecture in two weeks from today on the history of Halloween. Um, two weeks after that, we are going to have Drew DeCamp from the local Elkhorn Valley Museum come down and talk how small museums work. And then the second Thursday of December, I will be delivering a lecture on the history of Christmas. Um, and it's not going to be like the Christmas story of Jesus. It's going to be more of how we have celebrated Christmas over the last 2,000 years and how that has developed. 
So once again, thank you for coming out. If you're a student and didn't sign in, please make sure you sign in before you leave. The sign-in sheet is right next to the utensils. And please take food with you students. We will see you in a couple weeks. Thank you, everybody.